Welcome to the Knowledge Craft Seminar. Today is the third week of the series. Therefore, I thought it would be good for us to get a big picture view of how these different sessions are sequenced. In the first two sessions, uh, we talked about what is a knowledge graph. We started off by defining what a knowledge graph is, and then we considered two popular data models, which are um, used for defining knowledge graphs. For the next three sessions, we are going to be focusing on how to create a knowledge graph. And first of those sessions is going to be today where we are going to be primarily focusing on the uh, design of the knowledge graph. And then after those three sessions, we will uh, discuss how to uh, reason with knowledge graphs and how to access knowledge graphs. And towards the end of the series, we'll be talking about applications and uh, research issues. Okay, so on with today's topic, uh, which is going to be on how to create a knowledge graph. I will start by giving you an overview of uh, what does it involve to create a knowledge graph. And then uh, we will talk about uh, the considerations for designing an RDF graph and designing a property graph. And towards the end, I will conclude with a summary of the key points. There are two uh, broad steps in creating a knowledge graph, uh, designing of a schema, and then populating that schema with a set of instances. At this point, you could say, well, wait a minute. We said that knowledge graphs don't require any schema. It's a schema-free approach. Strictly speaking, that is true. Uh, the schema of a knowledge graph is that it's a set of triples, right? And that's all you need to get started in building a knowledge graph. But we assume that once we have built the knowledge graph, we want, want to do something with it. So meaning or defining meanings and defining what those relations mean and what kind of inferences we can draw from them, what conclusions we can draw from them, how those relations are defined, that is important. Eventually that is going to be important. We don't, we may not want to do that work, all that work upfront, but at some point in the life cycle of the knowledge graph, that work has to be undertaken. And to the degree we can do some upfront design and it fits in our uh, uh, development process and development scope, it definitely is very helpful down the road. So that's really where we are going to uh, focus uh, today's discussion on what sort of things we have to keep in mind uh, for designing the uh, knowledge graph. For the next two sessions, the focus is going to be on populating the knowledge graph. And the information which goes into the knowledge graph could come from any number of sources. It could be coming from uh, structured data sources. It could be coming from semi-structured data sources. Uh, we could be getting this through um, uh, doing NLP over text or using some computer vision techniques. Uh, and finally, it could be created using old fashioned methods by typing it in through, uh, through data curation. We will look at many of these uh, techniques in uh, next two sessions, but for today, I'm going to primarily focus on the design of the schema of the knowledge graph. We'll begin with uh, uh, the design of an RDF graph. The design guidelines for RDF knowledge graphs can be summarized in what's known as uh, linked data principles. These principles were uh, originally introduced and articulated by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who is also credited with the uh, invention of the World Wide Web. And these are very simple principles, and that's really the beauty of them. Uh, they can be state, simply stated as uh, you use IRIs to name things, use HTTP IRIs so that people can look up those things, and whenever someone looks up an IRI, provide uh, useful information using standards, RDF and Sparkle. And in your data set, include links to other things so that people can discover new things. Okay, so these are the main principles, design principles uh, for RDF graphs. Uh, we will look at each of these principles in a little bit more detail. Let's start with the first principle, use IRIs as uh, uh, names of things. We are used to naming things on the web 
such as websites using URLs. So for Wikipedia, we know what is a URL. And, and as we discussed in the previous lecture, a URL is also an IRI, right? So that part is very simple and easy to understand. But the primary generalization in an RDF data model is that in addition to information resources, we can also talk about non-information resources. For example, a person. So Dave Smith might be a person in real world. There may not be a website corresponding to uh, Dave Smith, but by creating an IRI corresponding to Dave Smith, we can refer to it in our uh, data set and not just refer to it, we can uniquely refer to it. So anytime we are using IRI, the uh, intention behind is that it's a unique way to refer to uh, the object with which we are creating uh, that IRI. The basic guidelines uh, with the design of IRIs is to uh, keep them short and mnemonic. In general, these uh, IRIs could be used by computer programs. So what they are doesn't actually make a lot of difference, but uh, it's kind of like when we are writing a computer program, we want the variable names to be meaningful so that if any person ever looks at them, they can make sense of the code. So this principle is in the similar spirit that these URIs are eventually going to be used by humans. Humans will look at it. So we want to keep them short. We want to keep them mnemonic so that it's easier for the humans to make sense of what, what is in a particular RDF data set. The second uh, important guideline for uh, IRIs is that we should define them so that they are going to persist over a long period of time. And this uh, uh, principle and intuition is not different from URLs. Like when we create a web page, in the web page, we uh, provide certain URLs and we want those URLs to be persistent because other people may use to point to those URLs. And if we are going to keep changing our URLs, the, we'll have a lot of broken links, right? So it's the same idea here. It's just that we are applying that idea now to also IRIs that correspond to non-information resources or objects, uh, which we may want to refer to on the web. May, I have a question, comment. Yes. Um, just a minute ago, you said IRIs are unique. Um, so there's two ways that one can interpret that, that an IRI refers to one object, only one object. The other is that there's only one IRI for each object. I Surely you mean the first, I'm not sure you mean the second. Yes, I, I mean the first. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Okay, now let's talk about the second principle. Um, use HTTP IRI so that people can look up those names. Now, we are all probably familiar with this idea of a document object identifier, which is shown here in the, in the third line. Um, this is a way to refer to, op, uh, to documents online. Like if you go to a search engine and you type uh, this DOI colon, the string followed by it, it will take us to that particular document on the web. But the recommendation or the design principle here is that instead of using URIs which do not specify the access method, we should be explicit and prefer an IRI in which we use an HTTP access method. So that the way we are going to access that particular object is clearly spelled out as part of the data set. And when a computer program encounters uh, that IRI, it knows what to do with it. It knows where to go to find more information about it. Now, in this the principle, this idea of lookup needs a little bit more explanation. Uh, the lookup of an IRI is also referred to as uh, dereferencing. It's referred to as dereferencing a particular IRI. And depending on whether we are dealing with a information object and a non-information object, different things may happen when we look up that IRI. The traditional information object is something we are used to. It's kind of like a website. It's like accessing something uh, through a web browser. And the behavior 
is exactly the same as what happens in a web browser. We would get the rep representation of the current state of that IRI. So in some cases, we would get a web page or we may get a web page that has a set of data items, et cetera. But things become interesting when we are looking up or dereferencing a non-information object. In the case of the non-information object, we would get a set of RDF facts about it. So it's no longer uh, necessarily a, a web page, or even if it is a web page, it's a set of uh, uh, RDF facts that are embedded in that uh, web page. Okay. Now, then the next principle is giving us more detail about those RDF facts, that these are not just any random set of RDF facts. We want these facts to be useful. Uh, you know, it's given that we would want to use standards such as RDF and Sparkle to uh, provide these uh, facts, but we want these facts to be useful. And let's now <laughs> look at that usefulness aspect. And the usefulness aspect uh, essentially comes from this quest or desire to define meaning, right? Uh, because when we are publishing these facts, we have to in some way be able to say what these facts actually mean. And World Wide Web Consortium has uh, made this task a little easier by providing people with some number of standard vocabularies that people can use for uh, publishing their RDF data sets. So for example, if you are uh, publishing some information about organization, there exists a organizational vocabulary uh, which is available in RDF that one can pick up and use the standard relation names from that vocabulary to publish the data, right? So it just makes it easy. If you publish your data using that standardized vocabulary, anybody who is using that data can also reference that same vocabulary and be clear about what you actually mean or what this data is trying to convey. In the last lecture, we had also mentioned uh, this initiative called schema.org, which is a community trying to evolve a set of shared vocabularies for domains which are of high interest for supporting uh, search queries over internet, okay? So to the degree we can leverage these existing resources, it makes the RDF data, set, RDF data that we publish on the web more useful in the sense that it is findable by other people and other people are ab able to write programs which can assume a certain meaning associated with the data that you are publishing. So uh, to give a concrete example of that, we will look at uh, the, uh, look, look at an example data set in which we are describing the cabinet of United Kingdom, okay? And the cabinet of United Kingdom here has an objective uh, object identifier called CO, uh, but it's in a namespace for which we have defined a prefix. And the prefix is the first line that you see here in this uh, set of RDF code. Uh, that is the prefix. And in the second line here, we are saying that UK cabinet colon CO has a type of org colon organization. Okay, RDF colon type, we have encountered that predicate name before. It, it is saying that this object is of type organization. And org colon organization is a standard vocabulary which is published by W3C. And here we are making use of that available vocabulary. And in relation to that, we are saying that this object is of type organization. In the third sentence here, we are saying that this object CO has a SCOS colon pref label called cabinet office, okay? Now this is not very deep semantics or deep technology here, but SCOS here is a, another standardized vocabulary known as simple knowledge organization system. It's simply giving, defining a predicate name to associate labels with objects, right? It's kind of like documentation string or a pretty name. Uh, corresponding to an object. 
right? And if you follow along uh, the rest of the triple, you will see that we are using other uh, relation names from the organizational ontology uh, or organizational vocabulary to uh, define the uh, various triples here in this data set. Now, at this point, a natural question that arises is what happens if we want to publish a data set uh, for a particular domain or an application, but the vocabulary that we are needing does not exist. Nobody else has provided it. And obviously, one way or preferred way would be to work with the schema.org group because it's a, it's a community of people who are uh, who have the charter of evolving these uh, consensus uh, vocabularies. Uh, but there are still some principles, like regardless of whether you um, work with schema.org or you invent something uh, on your own, uh, the principles behind creating new, new vocabularies are, it should be documented, it should be self-describing, there should be a versioning policy, like if you change your vocabulary from time to time, you, people should be able to track which particular version you're talking about. Uh, it should be available in multiple languages because we want this vocabulary to be usable over internet. So it should be available in uh, multiple languages so that is, it is useful all across the world. And it should be uh, published by a trusted source. And that really builds on this uh, pr persistence principle that we had talked about earlier, that vocabulary should be placed in a in a, in a location or a website, which is not going to easily change. It's going to be around uh, for a long time. Most of these principles are self-explanatory. I mean, we can just understand what they are trying to convey, but I'll say a little bit more about uh, what do we mean by self-describing? Because that's kind of an interesting uh, concept. Uh, it's interesting because it requires that when we define a new vocabulary or a new schema, we want to make sure that um, all the information we need to understand that schema is available within the schema itself, right? So, so it is self-describing in the sense that anything that we need to know to understand that schema is contained in it. Okay, we can look at just that schema and we know what what the schema is about. Okay. Let's now uh, move on to the fourth and uh, final principle, which is uh, include links to other things so that people can discover new things, right? Now, at the simplest level, this is exactly the same thing as making hyperlinks in our text documents, except that in this case, we are not making links within text documents, we are making links in a data set, right? And we are linking from one data set to potentially one or more other data sets. So to understand that a little bit more deeply, um, let's look at what kind of links one could, uh, one could make between different data sets. We know that in the traditional document web, there's only, only one kind of hyperlink. You know, there's a hyperlink and you click on it and you navigate to the uh, other document. But in the case of uh, links in RDF data sets, it is important to distinguish among these uh, three different kinds of links, relationship links, identity links, and vocabulary links. And we'll look at a concrete example of each one of them. A relationship link is a link between two objects uh, which are in two different data sets, right? So let's look at the triple, which is uh, shown here. The subject is shown in red, the predicate is shown in blue, and the object is shown in uh, green. Uh, these, this triple is written using the two prefixes that are also defined above it, right above it. So here, big colon Dave Smith is a data object is in one data set, and dbpedia colon Birmingham is a, object in a completely different data set, which in this case happens to be a data set named dbpedia. And we are relating these two objects using a relation fourth colon base underscore near, okay? And interestingly, fourth colon uh, base near is coming from a vocabulary known as fourth. It's again, one of the uh, standard vocabularies which is used on the web to 
describe people and four fair stands for a friend of a friend. It's, it's essentially a, a vocabulary to describe people and relationships between people. So this is an example of a relationship link. Uh, next, we are going to look at identity links. Uh, identity links are links uh, which equate objects in two different data sets, right? Uh, so here, the triple is shown as in the last sentence here again. Uh, subject is in red, predicate in blue, and the object in green. And here we are saying that an object ds colon me is same as object big colon Dave Smith, okay? In it, a minute ago, uh, Mike had raised this question of the uniqueness of IRIs. And this example illustrates that uh, one object can have multiple URIs and we can equate those URIs using these uh, same as assertions, okay? Uh, but both of them are actually referring to the unique object in the, in the real world. Uh, finally, let's uh, look at vocabulary links. A vocabulary link is a link which connects uh, uh, data to the definition of the terms. Uh, so here we have an object, a big colon, small medium enterprise, and we are asserting that it is a subclass of DBpedia colon company. Okay. Now subclass of is considered as part of the uh, definition of the object. And we are uh, defining a medium enterprise as a subclass of company, which is defined as a, as a class in the, in the DBpedia vocabulary, okay? So once again, to reinforce, uh, these links are, you, they can be viewed as generalization of hyperlinks, right? In hyperlinks, which are basically links between uh, documents in, uh, on the traditional HTML uh, web, these are links between objects and they could be either uh, uh, equating things, they could be defining things, or they could be simply making assertions about objects uh, across uh, different data sets. Okay, uh, so th that's pretty much it. And you know, I spend uh, actually a lot of time uh, looking for material on the design of the graphs and and I chose to cover these four principles because these are coming straight from uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and these are very simple, easy to understand uh, that if when you're doing your RDF graphs, uh, uh, use IRIs as names of things, uh, use HTTP IRIs and uh, publish your data using RDF and Sparkle. And whenever people look things up, give them something useful, right? And Again, I think his hope and vision was that if you follow these four basic principles for publishing uh, data on the web, it would eventually explode in the same way that the document web has uh, exploded. And we will see new kinds of uh, uh, services and capabilities which, are, which will become possible, which are not possible today. So Vinay, there's a, there's a question about uh, whether certain vocabularies exist or don't exist. Uh, the specifics here um, have to do with companies and relationships between companies, but generalizing that is how does one find uh, useful relations? I mean, you mentioned a few uh, common, uh, common collections like FOF and RDFS and so forth. How does one find those? Is there a mechanism for, for you know, if I wanted to say subclass of, where would I find that? How would I find out wh what the right yeah. So yeah. All right. Yeah. So the there are two sources that I personally use. Uh, one is to just to read the standard specifications. Like if you go and read the standard uh, specification for RDF, it would list some of the vocabularies. So it will list things like organizational vocabulary and the catalog vocabulary, and it will give you links on where to go find that. So that's one one place I start from. The second one is schema.org. Right, with schema.org, I mentioned several times, it's a community initiative to do just that. You know, they, they, this is a group of people who are trying to figure out what vocabularies are most commonly useful and, and they are creating them, right? And they have a website and you can search them and they, they have a very nice documentation. So those are the two places I would begin from. I'm pretty sure there are more resources, right? And, but those are the, 
first two that I sort of came across. So, uh, so the flip side of that question is uh, now let's say I've collect, found, put my hands on a couple of those sources and let's say I find a, a relation like subclass of in multiple places. Is there a way of deciding which one is a better one to use? Uh, do I know that they mean the same thing? How does one uh, make a choice in that case? Yeah, so I, I think the subclass of is the easier one because it's part of the standard W3C specification. And so I would say, well, for something like subclass of, just use the one which is defined in the RDF spec, right? Uh, but the same question obviously applies to other relationships, right? So like a friend relationship or a parent relationship or, right? And there, uh, again, I would prefer things which are in schema.org because which are which have a lot of following behind them and, and they are being used, they are used in the search engines. And uh, but beyond that, I think we just have to look at the information that is available about each of those uh, relations, either available as uh, a as a documentation string in English or uh, available as a set of axioms or available as example uses of it in some sample data sets, right? So that determination, you know, we'll have to make on our own as to which particular definition of a relation is closest to what we are trying to accomplish using our data set. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to move on to uh, the design of a property graph. Now, in the case of a property graph, what are the design questions or, or considerations? And these, again, are very simple. <laughs> the questions are, okay, what should be the nodes and labels and properties in my property graph data model? Should I make something a node label or should I introduce a new property? Should I uh, introduce a new relationship in my property graph data model? Uh, should I make something a relationship property? And what do I do if I encounter things which cannot be captured using triples, right? All of these things, they arise. Uh, and these are not very deep philosophical questions. They are, they are straightforward engineering questions, software engineering questions. And, um, and I'll try to sort of talk through them using some very simple examples. Okay, now my simplest example is we are trying to capture people, okay? So we, we have two people in our domain, John and Mary, and we want to represent them in our property graph. So in a property graph a data model, we would have a node for John, not node for Mary. Each of these nodes is going to have a label associated with it. And in this example, we have a label person associated with each of these two nodes. Label in general is kind of like a class, right? And that's sort of how it gets used uh, in property graph uh, data models. Uh, the labels uh, represent uh, classes. Now, going a step further from it to talk through whether to introduce new classes, whether to uh, introduce node properties, as again, a very simple example. You may even think that it's a dumb example. <laughs> Why am I even making this to be a problem? But it's primarily for pedagogical purposes because the issues I'm going to talk through, they are the issues you would face when you're making uh, these decisions, even when you're modeling something very complicated. And the example is how to model gender, right? How, how can we say that uh, John is a male and Mary is a female? Okay, that's a very simple thing we want to do. Okay, now the first and obvious solution to this uh, problem is just introduce a new class, okay? And so labels, as we said, are kind of like classes. So we already had a label person with these two nodes. We would introduce a new label, male with a node called John and a new a label called female with a node called Mary. Okay, now this is a, a fine solution. Um, the only consideration, and again, this is sort of more of a uh, aesthetic and stylistic uh, consideration is that these labels should be natural, right? It shouldn't be that, oh, you know, we, we turn, it turn these into long paragraphs, paragraph descriptions of these nodes. They should be 
you know, noun phrases, verb phrases, uh, short enough so that they make sense as uh, classes. The other, maybe a more trickier uh, uh, consideration is that these labels should not change with time, right? Because if these labels change with time, then it makes the modeling or representation much more complicated. Uh, in the case of gender, you know, 99.9% .9 cases, it as of today, it doesn't change very often. So we probably are okay. Uh, the other consideration here is uh, the use of indexing. Uh, most property graph data models, they do indexing on classes and they do indexing on relations, but they don't do indexing on node properties and relationship properties. They don't index them. Uh, so if we are going to uh, be accessing our data so that we are going to uh, be retrieving male versus female quite often, then this would be a great choice because in that case, we can take benefit of uh, indexing and we would have fast access. But at the same time, you could argue that, well, no, I don't want to introduce classes. I just want to model these as properties. Okay, I want to have a property in my property graph data model uh, in which its property is called gender. It can have two values, male and female. Okay, now, from the pure point of view of capturing the information content, the two designs are equivalent, right? There is no difference because we're still capturing that one person is a male, the other person is a female. Uh, we still have that consideration that this property cannot change with time. It, it should remain static. Uh, the only difference between these two is in indexing because uh, in the first case, the data will be indexed on whether somebody is a person or or no, but or somebody is a person. Somebody is a person. Uh, some person is a male or a female. In the second case, there is no indexing on the gender, right? So uh, the access would be slower if, for our queries, we are going to be doing uh, selection on these uh, node properties. Okay. Now <laughs> there is a third solution for capturing gender, and the third solution is that we can model gender as an object. Okay. And in this case, um, we have a gender object and with gender object, we are going to um, associate a property called name, which could have value male or female. And we will have a has gender relationship between a person node and the gender node. Okay. Now you would say, this is crazy. Why would, why would anybody want to do this? Well, one situation where you may want to do this is if your relationship is going to change the time, right? Now, granted that gender is not a relationship for most people, it does not change the time, but we know that there are some people for maybe very small number of people for who gender can change the time. And if we want to uh, track that in our uh, knowledge graph, then the only way to do that is through uh, modeling this as a relation and introducing a relationship property with the relationship because that lets us track from what date that relationship holds true, okay? Uh, yeah, now, and now in this case, one big disadvantage of this uh, third representation is that uh, we will need gender property for every single node and suddenly the size of our knowledge graph has become double. Right. If you had thousand people, we would have thousand gender nodes, and suddenly our knowledge graph has blown up in size, and it's not clear what information, what additional benefit we are getting other than this very uh, capturing this very corner case. Now, I think from a practical point of view, if the real example was just the gender example, either first or the second representation is fine, maybe first is preferred because it also gives us uh, faster access. But if we had a situation where we wanted fast access and simple representation, but we also needed to capture this time varying uh, nature of uh, properties in some cases, maybe we will end up with some combination of these two, okay? So, so my goal with this, very simple example was to illustrate the uh, considerations and concerns in how you choose between these three different alternatives. 
right? The first alternative is simplest. It gives us faster access. The second alternative, uh, it gets around the problem of making very artificial classes. You know, it probably doesn't make sense for certain things to uh, have classes. So their properties make sense. And the third representation is very useful when we want to capture time varying uh, nature or, or we want to associate additional properties uh, with the relationship, then the only way to do that is through modeling them as relationships and associating properties uh, with that relationship. Vinay, question? Yes. So uh, just a clarification perhaps, you said uh, if we use the third approach that we have to have if we have a thousand people, we have to have a thousand gender nodes. Um, that's, there, there are two ways that, it's clear that you have to have a thousand gender links. Do, do you actually have a thousand gender nodes or do you have two gender nodes, one for male, one for female, and then a thousand links to those two nodes? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, you, you could just do with two nodes, but you'll need uh, uh, thousand, 2,000 links if you have 2,000 people. Just clarifying, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think that's a, that's a good clarification. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm actually, I know this was a little artificial example, but uh, this issue of the efficiency of access, I wanted to uh, drill a little bit deeper into this and also uh, explain this using a slightly different example, which you may not find as silly as this as this gender example. Uh, so this is a movies example. So we are trying to model movies and their genres, okay? And uh, one approach is that we have a node uh, called, a node which has a label of movie and it has a property called genre, okay? And so if you have a movie, Iron Man, we can associate genres with it, action and superhero, right? And then there is, a, a second approach in which we have a node which is type movie like before Iron Man, but then we have a genre node. And then we associate a genre object with the movie object using has genre relationship. And then the genre ad object can have node, node properties like action and superhero, okay? So I wanted to illustrate how these, this choice of these two different representation would affect the query, okay? And, and how it interplays with indexing. Now, we, we will illustrate that by taking the example of a, a very simple query. We're looking for movies which have same genre, which have genre in common. So if uh, we had the first representation, we, would write our query as match M1 colon movie and M2 colon movie. We are basically looking for two movies where uh, X in M1 genre, where we are iterating over genres of the first movie is also in the genre of the second movie. That's what this where clause is doing. And then we are making sure that we are not doing this uh, genre overlap for the same movie. The movies have to be distinct and then we will return the two movies, okay? So that's the query using which uh, uh, we would use the first representation to figure out movies which have the same genre. In the second representation, uh, the query will be written as uh, shown here. We would say we are looking for a movie object which has a genre G, and then we will look for a second movie object which also has the same genre G. Okay, that's how we get the same genre. And then like before, we make sure that these two are distinct movies and we will return, return the two movies. Now, the basic difference between these two queries is that in the first query, we are having to pretty much do set intersection. You know, we are doing the intersection of um, uh, properties in the, in the, of one movie with the properties in the other. Uh, movie and given that these um, these are properties are not indexed, this can be an expensive operation, right? In the case of genres, it still may not be that cost prohibitive, but if we had a node property which had lots and lots of values, computationally this may not be the best choice. 
In the second representation, the graph engines, most graph engines that are out there, that's what they do. You know, they, they will index their relationships. They are super fast, crazy fast on traversing these relationships. And they will be definitely able to evaluate the second version of the query much, much faster than the first version uh, of the query. Okay. So this is sort of uh, a trade-off between uh, whether to uh, make something as a node property versus whether to create new objects and create links uh, between the, those objects. And the basic uh, 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 consideration is that if you are going to be uh, accessing those links a lot of time and we are going to be doing a lot of computations on those links, it's better to turn them into uh, objects, which a graph engine is uh, typically uh, optimized for. Okay, now, um, so we've talked about uh, uh, node properties and difference between node properties and, and whether to use node properties or whether to create relations. Let's now look at uh, when should we use relationship properties? When does it make sense to use the relationship property? Uh, now, the, we've already considered a one use case for relation property, and that is whenever there is dynamism, whenever we have to track time varying information, it makes sense to turn that into a relationship property so that uh, we, can, we can track it. We've seen other examples uh, where we want to associate provenance, like where this, this particular relationship came from. Let's say we want to do that. And for that use case, it's very easy to uh, introduce a new relationship property and model it. And same thing with the confidence. So just like uh, uh, node properties, the relationship properties are typically not indexed. Most uh, graph engines out there, they won't uh, index them. So if our query is such that we have to do a huge selection based on the relationship properties, then relationship property may not be the best choice. Whereas if bulk of our querying and selection is going to be done based on navigating the relations and the relationship property is going to come up only in the last filtering stage of the query, then we may be okay, right? The relationship properties may, may work out. But if we have a situation where we have to do a lot of selection uh, using the uh, relationship properties, we have queries like that, then the only way around that is to reify that relationship and turn this relationship property also into a relation, okay? And I know we talked about reification in, in the case of the RDF data model in a previous lecture. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the reification technique in the context of, uh, uh, of the property graph model, we will see that the underlying technique and the idea is essentially the same. It's basically the same idea, uh, but you know the, it's being presented in a different context. Okay, so uh, the, yeah. So some of this slide I've already covered that many systems do not index on the relationships and uh, for performance sensitive queries, it is better to reify those relationships. So performance is certainly one, uh, one reason for wanting to reify relationships. The other reason for reifying relationships is when we have, when we are dealing with a non-binary relationship. And a typical example of a non-binary relationship is uh, a between relationship. We want to say that X is between Y and Z. This is a relationship which is inherently a relationship between three things. It's not a binary relationship, right? And it's not, straightforward to capture it uh, using a knowledge graph uh, representation. But if we are going to capture in the knowledge graph uh, representation, reification is the way to do it. And the way that works is we will create an object that represents the relationship. So in this case, we create a node which represents the between relationship, okay? And then we create objects for each argument of the relationship. So there would be a node for X, node for Y, and node for Z. And then we would relate those objects to the relationship object using the relationships of our choice, right? So in this case, we said, okay, uh, we will have a relationship called has object 
and the relation the relationship between the between object and the x object is has object and the relationship between between object and y and z is the has between relationship okay so what we have essentially done is we've taken a ternary relationship and we have broken it or represented it using a set of binary relationships now you may recall from the previous lecture this is kind of what we were doing even for the rdf data model except that in rdf there is a already established vocabulary for doing this they give you relations like rdf colon subject predicate object uh, to do this reification if you want you can use the same relationships to do here i just uh, chose to use different relationships to articulate that the concept of reification is really independent of what the relation relationship names are we can do it many different ways and in rdf there is a one particular choice of relationships and here you know i chose a slightly different set of relationships but the underlying problem that we are trying to solve is the same we have a ternary relationships and we are trying to uh, represent it uh, using a set of binary relationships in our knowledge graph okay so that's uh, pretty much uh, the uh, essence of what i wanted to convey today in the design of knowledge graphs in these two different data models um, and i'll try to summarize what we went over in this lecture <clears throat> clearly the considerations in the design of knowledge graphs there are common considerations right what should be a class what should be a relation uh, when to do reification how to do reification these problems are common to both rdf data model and the property graph data model i mean i just sort of presenting presented certain problems under the umbrella of uh, uh, the property graph model but you have to make similar choices in the case of the rdf uh data model also the problem actually is the same even though sort of i chose to present them under uh, different headings and yet there are some differences uh, in the design consideration uh, i mean in the case of rdf uh, knowledge graph this uh, uh, ability to use the data over web that is a driving consideration you know people are worried about uh, others being able to find and understand the data we are publishing there is explicit mandate for uh, using vocabulary standard vocabularies and for linking making links across data sets now it does not mean that these principles and guidelines are not useful for property graph data models right if you are building a property graph data model uh, it would be very beneficial if you are reusing a vocabulary right and if, if you are using a property graph data model it would be great if you made links right it would solve a lot of problems when we are uh, trying to do data integration down the road uh, so just because you know these principles have been introduced in the context of rdf data model it doesn't mean that they are not relevant or applicable to the property graph data model I mean they are equally applicable and useful it's just that many uh, uh, property graph data models they get used in a uh, uh, sort of closed enterprise settings and in those settings the data is sort of proprietary it is behind uh, closed firewalls and this publication over web is not a central consideration right but even in those cases when when companies are using property graph data models within behind their closed firewalls sometimes you know they have their own internal schemes for naming things which are kind of like iris right so for example uh, in many uh, uh, organizations they have to have a unique customer id right and they have these elaborate schemes to figure out how they are going to uniquely identify a customer they don't bother to publish it over web right but this problem of uniquely identifying objects it exists regardless of whether you are doing it over web or whether you are doing in a very uh, uh closed enterprise settings uh and then i should say that in in property graph uh, uh, uh design discussion there was sort of a lot of emphasis on indexing and how how you optimize the query what queries do you have and and that's a little bit unique to the way uh, uh property graph 
architectures or property graph architectures are being used uh, because they are in this niche space of being able to optimize graph traverses or being able to do analytics where we have to chase relationships uh, among objects. And so finally, to sort of conclude, uh, I like to state that um, the flavor of the material that I presented in, in this lecture, it's not uh, the flavor of like a mathematics or hard science. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, these are guidelines, I mean, these are good to follow. And, and in many cases, there are equivalent good choices. And, and in many cases, if you don't follow a certain design guideline, Things are not going to break. Uh, I mean, you may get less benefit out of your data. You may get uh, uh, less capability, less functionality, but it's it's not a disaster, right? So it's so it's it should be interpreted in that that spirit that these principles are there to uh, help us get best or most use of out of the systems we are building, and we should uh, try to leverage them to the to the degree it's possible. And at the same time, we should also recognize that in many cases, there are equivalent good choices, right? It's not like there is one answer, which is always the best answer for all circumstances. So that's the wrap up of uh, uh, today's lecture. A uh, couple of questions, Vinay. Yes. Uh, first of all, um, earlier you talked about dereferencing IRIs. So we know what the format of that is, you use an HTTP and mention the IRI uh, from at that particular source. Uh, what I didn't hear was the format of the reply. Um, you suggested that uh, Sir Tim requires that we that the sort that the the provider provide more information. But what format is that information? If I were trying to build a program that use that IRI, try to dereference that IRI, how would I know what to expect the return would be? Yeah, so I mean, I would expect that it's a RDF data set, right? Which could be either um, just set of RDF triples or it could be an RDF graph. Well, that you said expect. Of course, the issue is that you also mentioned informational uh, IRIs, which are normal web pages and you would expect something which isn't an RDF graph, but is actually just an HTML page that may re be returned or something else. Right. So the question is, how does one know what the format of the return is? The Most of the comment had to do with what the format of uh, the query is, the, the IRI is, and also what the graph holds, but how what one gets back when you dereference is unclear. Yeah, so I, I agree that it's unclear and I feel clear on the uh, picture that if you do the dereferencing using Sparkle, you would get RDF data or an RDF graph. Um, but if you are dereferencing an information object, you are clearly not getting an RDF graph or RDF data, you're getting HTML, right? Yeah. And so the, I actually don't know the answer to that. I, right. I, I just thought it'd be worth commenting on that. Okay. So there are a couple of specific questions here. Uh, let me just read this for you. Can you please share your insights on how the KG and RDF search in specific domains will evolve in the next 10 years? Um, say, uh, using analogy with how search evolved over web pages in the last 20 years or so. What's, how is it going to be different? How is it going to be the same as the way the web grew, the, the traditional web grew? How is the, the semantic web going to grow? Is it going to be the same? Is it, we expect to see differences? What, any comments on that? Well, <laughs> the only rule about predicting future is <laughs> don't predict it, right? But uh, I think the vision that we have and vision that a lot of people in the community have had is that... Uh, a compelling use case for this RDF type knowledge graphs is that uh, search engines can issue queries and they can provide more useful knowledge panels um, as part of the query results. And over a period of time, the web searching could evolve into web question answering, right? Where you're not just dealing with, you're not just processing a set of keywords and giving documents, but for some cases you can actually give answers, right? And it's the query processing over RDF 
is the mechanism. It's, it's a very plausible mechanism which would provide an essential ingredient to that kind of um, uh, implementation. So we, sh we sort of, I, I had a use case of that in our first lecture, right? right? So the winter tour example. Yeah. And we have a couple of lectures later in the series uh, where we have people uh, coming uh, from Google as well as Amazon where they will talk about how they are using these knowledge graphs in the context of enhancing the search panels as well as for making recommendations. I have a few comments on the search part. Okay. Uh, so typically in some commercial or even the open source uh, not, uh, graph DBs, um, they have now introduced features for search um, because um, when you have a, a large enough database, then you naturally need search. And it is based on my understanding they've had to implement um, very similar techniques that go into regular search engines like inverted index, et cetera. So they internally, they create a completely separate inverted index, just like uh, Apache Leucine or something like that, which, which um, allows you to quickly look up these linked lists and calculate um, intersections, set in intersections unions of, um, of these linked lists. So at least right now, uh, if you look at the implementation, these things have parallelly, um, have parallelly, uh, uh, the the knowledge graph retrieval system and the search the search engine retrieval system have, have been parallelly and implemented both in these systems. Mm. So that is uh, that is how some products like Neo Four J are actually um, introducing search into their into their systems. I don't know if that helps. Uh, yeah. So essentially, um, essentially, you are saying that. Uh, traditional search and knowledge graph search is sort of merging, right? Yes, well, they have implementations. So they're offering both these kinds of features uh, in the same product, mm -hmm. but the implementations are quite, the storage implementations are actually quite different. Right. I don't think everyone, no, at least nobody has figured out how to have one common implementation, which provides for both. So the World Wide Web search uh, took off when uh, search engines began building crawlers that would crawl the web and, and index the information in various different sources to be further used by later on without having to any, any participation on the part of the owners of those, um, those sources. Is there, is there, is it, what's the equivalent? in the semantic web, the knowledge yeah, web. So, so I mean, I, I, I'm wondering whether there, whether there needs to be an equivalent. I think the equivalent is one potential equivalent. I, I wouldn't say this is the only potential equivalent is the extent to which the already established search engines like Google and Bing and others start making use of the structured data as part of their search results. Okay, but we're, we're talking here about the growth of the semantic web. Assume the web, World Wide Web disappears. There's still the semantic web remaining. Suppose I want to find out what sources relate Dave Smith to uh, NASA. You know, it'd be nice to know if there's a source out there that speaks to that. Right. Well, just, just a question. I, I don't no, know. No, I, I, I think it's a, this is a valid question. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think there is the question of, um, is there some kind of a uh, data crawl, just like we have a document crawl? And is there a kind of like a data search the way we have the document search? Yeah. Right? And um, yeah, I mean, I think those are, those are good questions. I personally don't have ready answers for them, but uh, I think this, these are interesting questions and and I hope we can, we, we can learn from some of the speakers who will come later on in the series. Yeah, I'd like to know what existing companies are doing in that space. And if not, why, is, why isn't there a, a startup or two? Right. On this? Okay, there are a couple of other questions that have come in. I think we have a little time. Uh, uh, the next question, uh, can you please share some guidance on what kind of information should be automatically ingested 
versus what kind of information should be kept, uh, should be in, 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 uh, rely on manual curation? Um, and, and how does one involve experts in quality control, presumably in both of those cases? So automatic ingestion versus manual curation and how do we do quality control? Yeah, so I, mean, I think this is a little bit getting ahead of uh, where we are. I mean, we do have a session on uh, extraction from text. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually, I in particular, I went out uh, looking for industry people and I posed exactly this question and I, I invited them to come to our series and address this directly. Uh, but I mean, I can give my short preview of my understanding of uh, what is the answer to this question. Uh, in general, I think for anything where we have a lot of labeled data, we can train a machine learning or automatic extraction using the training data. That's going to get automated first. Uh, but where we don't have data or where the accuracy requirement is very high is going to require um, human curation. Um, that's sort of the first level answer. And in terms of how to involve um, experts in the in the process um, you know I wish people like um, uh, people like Google and and Apple and others they told us about what they're doing behind their firewalls on how how they uh, curate the automatically extracted information but it's very difficult to get an answer um, in the, the, I'm sure they're doing a lot of manual validation and curation but um, but so what actually comment. they do is mystery to me. So I can comment here. Uh, in, in most companies that I've worked in, uh, they have had need to create and curate um, large databases of information. And overall, I've seen two or three uh, types. One is, as you said, uh, Vinay, uh, label data at the very beginning of the project. And it can be done in several ways. You have a team of experts and there are tools to facilitate and make the process of labeling very easy. So this is all done internally. There have been cases where they, um, if the data is not very sensitive, they spawn it as a task uh, into Amazon Mechanical Turk or some crowdsourcing mechanism that can go externally. That's one thing, that's sort of one class of uh, efforts. The other class is you actually release the product in some form and then you let actual users either implicitly or explicitly tell you about the quality, uh, like a community. So these are overall the two ways I've seen um, people or, or like semi-automatically or automatically curate these kinds of uh, systems. Mm -hmm. But as Vinay, you said, like we have some people who will spend a lot more time on that. Uh, okay, we have one final question here. Um, uh, will Google and I presume other large companies continue to dominate search, uh, even for specific domains, or will new players emerge in the case of the semantic web? Or are they already? We've kind of touched on that just a minute ago, but... Yeah, so, so I mean, again, I think we certainly don't want to get into the predict the future part, uh, but... Uh, I, but I think as far as we know, there are other startups working on doing better search. In fact, last year we had a couple of uh, speakers in the series. For example, uh, Anand Prakash, uh, Amit Prakash, uh, you know, he came and talked about a search engine that they are building, uh, which is primarily focused at enterprise markets and which works a lot differently like the fidelity at which you can pose the questions is very different from the way uh, you would expect from a, uh, a traditional search engine. I'm not saying that the traditional search is going to disappear, it probably won't, but clearly there are application verticals where you want a higher fidelity queries, higher fidelity search queries. And, and I think that problem space or that vertical is not very well addressed right now. And Amit Prakash's work uh, that he presented in our seminar last year is one example uh, of, of a startup in that direction. I'm, and I'm pretty sure there are many others working along similar lines. So this, this, uh, this quarter, we will have another search in new search engine, uh, Neva. 
Um, so someone from Neva will come and talk about the search engine that they're building. It's most, mostly, mostly ad free and, um, and those, they're dealing with those kinds of issues, but maybe they might have something to say about um, making the current web as a little more semantic, etc. So we can uh, save those kinds of questions for our guests from Neva. Right. Well, okay, but let me ask you guys a question on this, which is, um, do you see that semantic web search will be a, viewed as a separate capability from text search? Um, obviously, text search is benefiting from the semantic web, but would there be a different kind of search engine that would provide the sorts of high quality answers that Vinay was commenting on, as opposed to text search, which just produces lists of documents? Admittedly, Google does answer some questions, but uh, you know, I can also imagine a, a future where there is specifically a whole new kind of interface which provides these high fidelity. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think that definitely there is uh, there is need and space there for innovation. The only system which I know, well, actually, ThoughtSpot is one, and I think the other uh, system is uh, Wolfram Alpha, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, they have also tried to sort of. Uh, merge this search kind of interface with a higher fidelity uh, underlying computational processing. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, there is, there, there is more room for innovation there. Yeah, I think search has gone from documents. So 25 years ago, you put in a query, it gave you a list of documents. Then slowly Google in, inserted snippets, which are substrings of documents where your answer could lie. And now they've even gone to giving very, very specific answers, like which year was Obama born? They'll mm -hmm. give you like a substring. There's some type checking, etc. cetera, uh, I think there, and they'll give you literally that word so that maybe you can at some point have, um, do some op further operations on them. Right. Um, so Naren's in the view that Google is going to continue, it's just going to get better and better and better. And Vinay offers the possibility that there might be qualitatively different kinds of search services, which uh, would, would, ben, would directly answer, provide answers to questions using the semantic web. Yeah. So I think, um, I don't know how much time we have, but I think this is, a, I really like this topic. Yeah. Um, I think the, the reason by, why the World Wide Web became popular is because everyone could create documents without too much own, too much burden on them on uh, applying tags so that the web becomes semantic. So they could like dump everything that and express their thoughts without having too much burden on tagging stuff, parsing stuff, adding tags, etc. Uh, and I think that's still going to prevail, which puts more and more burden on the search engines to actually make sense of stuff. But let's see. Uh, how, how things evolve. Yeah. Right. All right. So um, maybe I should say a few words about our next session. Uh, so the next section is, is going to be on Thursday. And the theme, the overall theme we had given to the speakers was still how to design a knowledge graph. Uh, we had one cancellation. Uh, Deborah McGinnis um, had to um, cancel for some unavoidable reasons, but we were able to fill the gap. Uh, uh, with uh, Jose, Emilio, and Andra Wagmeister. Um, so we'll have Peter, uh, Peter Patel Schneider and these two gentlemen. Uh, Peter is going to be talking about um, a new language that he has designed for um, turning Wikidata into Wiki knowledge, making Wikidata uh, more machine understandable. And Jose and Andra, they are going to be talking about uh, adding information about COVID to Wikidata. Um, originally, we were thinking of this topic as uh, an example of evolution of a schema. I mean, clearly it is an evolution of an existing schema, but, uh, but we sort of, because of the events, we just brought it into this session. And, and I think it still fits nicely in the overall scope of design of a schema because at a very short notice, they had to figure out, you know, what information about COVID should go into Wikidata and, and they had to get people rallying behind that and they made it happen. So they'll talk about that in more detail on Thursday. So I think with both uh, Peter's presentation and 
uh, with these two gentlemen. It should be a very exciting session uh, this Thursday, and I look forward to seeing you all at that time. Thank you very much.